Hello everyone. Welcome to this online course produced by the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. We are a federally incorporated not-for-profit that promotes radiation safety and awareness through sharing science and best practice. Our guiding principle is good science in plain language. The purpose of this course is to support small businesses filling out the application to register their X-ray devices in conformance with Regulation 861 under the Occupational Health and Safety Act of Ontario. My name is Athena Wong and I'll be your presenter for today's class. We would like to make the disclaimer that the material provided here is not legal advice. We take no responsibility or liability in the application of the content, but the content is correct to Ontario at the time of production. This course is aimed at any workplace that has a device that is capable of producing x-rays. This includes the owners, employers, supervisors, and workers at these workplaces. Two categories of exceptions are X-ray devices capable of producing X-rays with energies greater than 1 MeV, which will be regulated by the CNSC, and X-ray devices intended to be used in the diagnosis or treatment of humans which are regulated under the Healing Arts Radiation Protection Act. For clarification, Regulation 861 classifies X-ray devices as X-ray machines if the purpose of the device is to create X-rays, for example, baggage scanners or veterinary X-ray systems. And the regulation classifies these devices as X-ray sources if X-ray production is incidental to the function of the device, for example, E-beam welders or electron microscopes. The learning goals for this course are twofold. We hope to provide you with a basic understanding of X-rays and X-ray safety. Then we intend to break down all the steps and components necessary to complete the application form for registering a new X-ray. The content of this course was put together using the resources listed below. Here is a top-level overview of the topics covered. X-ray fundamentals are slides 6 to 17 and will make up part 1 of this course. X-ray registration application make up slides 18 to 65 and will make up parts 2 and 3 of this course. To begin, we must have a basic understanding of X-rays. X-rays are electromagnetic radiation emitted from a machine. EM radiation behave like waves which propagate outward from a source. The properties and behavior of EM radiation is well studied and understood. Other forms of electromagnetic radiation include gamma rays, UV light, infrared light and visible light. The only difference in their properties is in their energy, which is directly related to their wavelength and frequency. Here is the electromagnetic spectrum. It is a continuous spectrum. The name divisions are what we use for our convenience. They come from a mix of historical reasons, their applications, and their source. The waves get more energetic from the left to the right, 
and the wavelengths of the waves get shorter from the left to the right. X-rays and gamma rays have the highest energy and shortest wavelength out of these types of EM radiation. X-rays and gamma rays are identical to each other aside from their source. X-rays are produced by man-made machines, while gamma rays come from the nucleus of atoms. The difference between a wave acting like a high-energy UV wave or a low-energy X-ray isn't definitive. It's not entirely clear because of the continuous nature of the spectrum. To produce X-rays, we need to start with electrons. We give the electrons lots of energy, making them move very fast. Then we get them to hit a target. And when they do, they will slow down and lose that energy. That lost energy is carried off in the form of an electromagnetic wave and heat. X-ray sources are typically electron-based devices. And when those electrons collide with something, they will produce incidental X-rays. X-ray machines will have a component in them that generate electrons, collide them with something to produce X-rays, and then manipulate those X-rays to accomplish a task. Every X-ray machine needs these components to operate. They all support the function of the X-ray tube. We'll be discussing how the X-ray tube works in more detail. Here is a schematic of a typical X-ray tube. Cathode is the electron source. The electrons are accelerated towards the anode through a high voltage. Anode is the target. High-speed electrons colliding with the anode is what produces X-rays. The anode is typically rotating when in operation so as to spread out the wear and tear from the electrons. Heatsink helps to prevent the anode from melting by carrying away all the excess heat generated by the electron collisions. Cathode and anode are enclosed in glass and put in a vacuum so that the electrons are not colliding with air molecules as they travel to the anode. Here is a labeled photograph of an X-ray tube to give you a better sense of what they look like in the real world. We cannot control the direction the X-rays travel in. It is a wave and will travel outward in all directions. Since it can easily get through glass, we need to put something around the glass that isn't so easy for the X-rays to travel through. Lead works well. Notice in the third point that the leakage is said to be minimized, not that there is no leakage. This will be discussed more when shielding is talked about. But we cannot stop 100% of the X-rays with shielding. We could have lead shielding as thick as a room, and eventually one X-ray will still make it through. Attached to the lead enclosure, there is often a collimator, or collimation system. Essentially, the collimator is just lead tubing. Since it is very hard for the X-rays to get through lead, the vast majority will only make it through if they travel through the opening. Remember, lead won't stop all the X-rays, but it will reduce the number getting through to a very small amount. 
The collimator helps to direct the x-rays to the precise spot where we want them, which lessens the risk of unnecessary exposure to the operator and patient slash target if there is one. Keeping all of this in mind, a typical X-ray machine will have three components to the X-ray field. There is a primary beam, shown as a dashed line in black, produced by the X-ray tube that comes out of the opening in the collimator. There is also secondary radiation, shown in red, that is made up of X-rays that are scattered or created due to the primary beam interacting with the target or shielding. Then there is leakage radiation shown in green, which is x-rays produced by the x-ray tube that made its way through the lead enclosure and collimator that is typically low level. All three types of x-rays are potential health hazards. Next, we will talk about how X-rays can cause harm. X-rays are ionizing radiation. They are energetic enough to ionize atoms and create ions. An ion is a charged particle. When X-rays interact with an atom, there is a chance for them to remove an electron from a neutral atom or molecule creating an ion pair. The negative electron that is ejected and the remaining positive ion. These ions, when interacting with neighboring atoms and molecules, can interfere with biological processes and cause harm to humans. The International Agency on Research on Cancer, IARC, lists ionizing radiation as group 1 carcinogenic to humans. For more information on ionizing radiation, please see our previous webinars, Understanding Radiation and Health Effects of Exposure to Radiation. In Canada and other countries, which follow the recommendations of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, ICRP, the assumed relationship between the ionizing radiation dose received and the risk of cancer is called linear non-threshold, or LNT. This model assumes a linear response based on data from populations which has received much larger doses than what are received occupationally, for example, the atomic bomb survivors. We have a previous webinar on regulatory bodies and international agencies for those who want to know more about the works of IARC and the ICRP. Radiation protection practices based on LNT require that workplaces keep radiation doses as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA. It is not acceptable to just keep doses below regulatory limits. You are likely expected to keep your doses from occupational x-rays, ALARA, to comply with occupational health and safety regulations. So how can we do that? X-ray equipment is an external source of radiation. To reduce those from external sources of radiation, we use the radiation protection principles of time, distance, and shielding. Lower the amount of time being exposed to radiation. 
increase the distance between the operator and the source of the radiation and use appropriate shielding. Remember that the lead enclosure and collimator are part of the shielding. So if they are damaged or compromised by an unqualified service technician, your doses might not be Alara. This brings us to the end of the X-ray safety fundamental section of this course. Next, we will go over the application form and how to complete it successfully. Because the section is longer, we have split it up into two parts. The first part will cover accessing the form and completing section one of the form. The latter part will cover section two of the form and how to submit it. The main information page for registering X-ray sources in the workplace is found at this link on the page right now. The form itself is found in this link in both English and French. We will complete the English version of the form in this course, but we can help with completing it in French if you reach out to us. If you have difficulty downloading or opening the form, you should try a different browser or update your copy of Adobe Acrobat or Adobe Reader. The province of Ontario has also created a guidance webpage with instructions, tips, and examples. The content of this course is based off this webpage. Here is a brief overview of the information you will need to complete this form. Remember that if you are completing the form electronically, you can save the document to continue later. Roughly, you will need information about your workplace, about the x-ray device, about a designated person responsible for safety, for example, the x-ray safety officer, a workload and shielding calculations, and a floor plan for the x-ray device. In section one of the form, you will need to enter information about the employer, the employer legal name, business number, and operating name are referring to the corporate entity. The employer business address should be the listed address of the corporation according to the federal or provincial records. Please note that the street number, street name, street type, and street direction are all separate fields. Do not put the whole address under street name. The employer contact information must be a person who can represent the corporation. For example, a director, officer, or authorized representative. Here is the federal corporation information page from the Government of Canada. Using the information from this page, you can complete the application information section of this form. Our address is 100 Shepherd Avenue East, Suite 760. Notice how it's written out in the form. Under Nature of the Employer's Business, please select only one category. Applicant notes to reviewer is for additional information and can include the x-ray's usage frequency or the purpose of the x-ray.
Section 2, X-Resource, is the bulk of the application. You will need to complete this section for each X-Resource that is operated by the corporation. If you have multiple sources, there is a button at the end of X-Resource number 1 to add another X-Resource. If you are completing the form by hand, please add the spaces necessary for additional sources before printing. At the start of Section 2, please select the nature of the source by checking all that apply. You must also indicate if you are completing this form because of the direction of an inspector from MLITSD. For each source, indicate in which room the source will be located. The name of the room must match the designation on your floor plan. Then, indicate when the source is expected to begin operation. Next, indicate the type of X-ray source between portable X-rays, cabinet X-rays, walk-in cabinet x-rays, and fixed x-rays. The next few slides will have examples of each of these types. Here is an example of a portable x-ray used to image a suspicious package. Here is another portable x-ray used for the same purpose. Here are two pictures of a cabinet x-ray used by the British Museum to analyze artifacts. Here is an example of a walk-in x-ray cabinet. And another example of a bank of walk-in x cabinet x-rays. Here is an example of a fixed x-ray, used here to image the con contents of a transport truck. This concludes part 2 of the course, where we went over how to complete section 1 of the form. Here is part 3 of the course, where we go over how to complete section 2 of the form. For each source you are registering, you will need to enter the make, model, and serial number of the source. You must indicate how the source is identified on the floor plan. You will also need to report the maximum rated tube voltage and the maximum rated current. The anticipated maximum workload is a calculated quantity and we will show you some examples of that calculation in a few slides. Most of this information must be obtained from the manufacturer's documentations. If the necessary information is not supplied in the documentation, you may need to contact the manufacturer to request this information. Here is a sample technical, document, uh, technical specification sheet for an X-ray gauge manufactured by a fictional company. Near the beginning of the sheet should be the manufacturer, device name and number, and serial number. Other information such as specifications for the components of the X-ray device is not needed for the application. The information sheet should contain maximum voltage and current. Note that you are looking for the maximum, not for normal operating values. If maximum values are not included, you may need to contact the manufacturers directly for that information.
with the information given in this example technical data sheet, here is what the filled out form will look like. The anticipated maximum workload is left blank as this is a calculated quantity and will typically not be provided in a data sheet. The guide from the province of Ontario provides instructions on the calculation needed to find the maximum anticipated workload. There is a different calculation for pulse type x-ray sources and for continuous beam x-ray sources. A sample calculation is provided for each type on the next four slides. To calculate workload for a pulse type x-ray source, you will need the following. One, the maximum current indicated in this equation as I max. Two, time per exposure, which is the time needed to get one exposure, typically given in fractions or decimals of a second. This value depends on the application of the x-ray. Most machines will allow you to set the exposure time. Make sure the units for this are in seconds. For example, 150 milliseconds is equal to 0 0.15 seconds. Three, exposures per week, which is based on your expectations for your business. If you expect to take 20 exposures in a typical week, you will put 20 here. With all this information in hand, input the values into the equation, multiply all three terms in the numerator, then divide by 60. The result will be, will be the anticipated maximum workload in milliamps minutes per week. In this example, suppose a veterinary clinic is using a pulse type x-ray with a maximum current of 2.6 milliamps. Each time they use the x-ray to take an image, the exposure time is one tenth of a second or 0.1 seconds. And they expect to do 15 exposures in a week or an average of three a day. We plug all information into the equation, multiply all the terms on top, then divide by 60. The anticipated maximum workload for this pulse type x-ray is 0 0.065 milliamp milli minutes per week. Next, we have a continuous beam type x-ray. To calculate workload for a continuous beam x-ray source, you will need the following information. One, maximum current in milliamps, shown in the equation as I max. Two, hours per week, representing how many hours the device is expected to be on and producing x-rays in a typical week. With all this information on hand, input them into the equation and multiply them, then multiply by 60 to get the anticipated maximum workload and milliamp minutes per week. In this example, suppose an x-ray gauge is used to evaluate the thickness of particle boards on a production line. The gauge has a maximum current of 3 milliamps and is always on 24-7. IMAX equals 3 milliamps. Hours per week equals 24 hours a day multiplied by 7 days a week giving us 168 hours per week of operation. 
entering these into the equation and multiplying everything together we get 30,240 milliamp minutes per week. Next in this section is the location of the x-ray source. An inspector should be able to find the building or site of the x-ray source with this information. If there is a street address, enter the address. If there is no street address, include enough descriptions so that an inspector can reach the location. The address you enter here must match what is stated on the work plan, on the floor plan. Note that, like before, the street number, name, type, and direction are all separate fields. Do not put everything under street name. Next in section 2 is for the responsible person. Each source requires a person to exercise direction of the safe use and operation of the x-ray source. If you have multiple sources, you can use the same person. Relevant radiation safety qualifications is where you list the training and qualifications of the responsible person. For example, X-ray safety officer training from the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada in December 2020. The last part of Section 2 is about floor plans and drawings. The floor plan must satisfy a list of requirements. It can be done by yourself or a third party you have hired. It can be hand drafted or drawn digitally, but must be legible. If it satisfies the list of requirements above, it will be suitable. The floor plan does not need to show the whole building or facility, only the room with the x-ray source and any adjacent space. The requirement to use a scale of at least 1 to 100 can be counterintuitive. For example, a scale of 1 to 50 is larger than a scale of 1 to 100 and suitable here. A scale of 1 to 200 is smaller than 1 to 100 and not suitable here. Think of it as comparing fractions. Here is the sample plan provided on the guide webpage. This sample plan contains an indication of the direction north, a scale of at least 1 to 100, and remember 1 to 50 is a larger scale than 1 to 100, location and range of motion of the x-ray source. Location of the control panel and exposure switch. Sum of the adjacent spaces. Shielding type and thickness. Note that a common omission is the material and thickness for all the walls, doors, ceiling, and floor. This information is how the Ministry will evaluate your shielding requirements, and if it's not included on the floor plan, the application will be rejected, and you will have to resubmit.
The plan is missing the following information. The name of the employer and address of the site. Adjacent spaces to the east, south, above, and below. Is it outside, an adjacent unit, a walkway, a parking lot? Type and location of safety devices. And optionally, occupancy factors, which represent what percentage of the work week each space is occupied. This is optional because there are default occupancy factors that you can see in the form. But if you anticipate alternate occupancy factors, you can include them under alternate occupancy factors. To determine the amount of shielding required, you can refer to safety code 28 or safety code 20A. Safety code 28 is a bit easier to understand, but both sets of instructions involve quite a bit of math. This is generally only necessary for fixed x-rays, since portable x-rays do not have permanent shielding, and cabinet x-rays will have shielding built into the cabinet. Lastly, after section 2, we come to the attestation section. This can be filled out by the employer or the person responsible, or someone else authorized by the employer. Pay attention to the date format of year, month, and day. Finally, after completing section one, section two, and the attestation, you can save and submit the form, either electronically by emailing it to radiationprotection at ontario.ca or printing the form out and mailing it to the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, Radiation Protection Services at 81A Resources Road, Toronto, Ontario, M9P3T1. The Ministry prefers electronic submissions. This brings us to the end of this course. Thank you for accessing this resource. If you have questions or require class clarifications, please reach out to the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. Our website is radiationsafety.ca our email is info at radiationsafety.ca. Our phone number is 416-650-9090. And our fax number is 416-650-9920. Good luck with your application.